Yeah. Right. And so is the question that, th so the question is that's why you'll always get these two as idempotents? Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I think I'm missing the, the question or the point. The, I mean, there are possibly many idempotents for this operation. There's only two if the ring happens to be an integral domain. That's what you proved for homework. We proved way back in the group theory section that if you look at a structure that happens to be a group, then there's only two then there's only one idempotent, right? Zero. So the only thing that has zero plus or a plus a equals a is a equals zero. So somehow not really knowing anything about the structure of this binary operation in general means that in general lots of things could happen and typically does, but in the situation where you're talking about just multiplication, in any ring, at least you've got those two that work. Why those two work? Mm -hmm. I guess these two are idempotents for different reasons. One is because we proved that zero times anything is zero. And this is because one times anything is itself. So somehow, this one sucks up everything. That's why zero itself works. This one, on the other hand, behaves as an identity. So one times a is a. You know, so zero times a is zero, and one times a is a, and that means if you plug in these two specific things, you get idempotence, but then there might be more. Maybe I haven't hit the answer. Let's chat after class. All right. All right. So what we're up to tonight is we're going to, we're really going to introduce the key player in what is going to be the focus of our attention for the remainder of the semester. It's a player that we've touched on briefly for the last couple of weeks but haven't really analyzed in detail. And the player is this. We're going to talk about what are called polynomial rings. And if you're thinking, well, we've already seen those. Yeah, we have, but we haven't formally defined what they are. I just asked you to sort of believe here's what the symbols are. And what we're going to do tonight is uh, look a little bit deeper as to what the structure of these things are. And so the idea is this. Start with any ring. So let capital R denote any ring you want. This construction that we're about to look at works for any ring you want. Of course, the rings that we're going to focus most on are rings with unity, so it's not unreasonable to think that this ring has a, a 1. That's fine. We'll look briefly tonight at a situation that you've already encountered. In fact, you looked at for a homework problem where the ring might not be an integral domain. That's going to cause certain issues. And then what we'll do after noting those issues is say, look, we're only going to be interested in using rings that happen to be integral domains. In fact, more specifically, we're only going to be interested in using rings R that happen to be fields because that's where the most interesting, interesting structure occurs. But the point is when I talk about this construction, it holds regardless of what ring you start with. What we're going to look at is this, the polynomial ring polynomial ring with coefficients in R okay, so that's what I'm defining is defined to be symbols of this type uh, the set of symbols that in look like this a0 plus A1x plus A2x squared plus dot 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 plus A sub n x to the n, where n can be anything, n is some positive integer, so I'm going to write it as z plus, n could be zero, that's the degree of this thing, and each of the A sub i's is in the underlying ring R. So the set that I'm asking you to look at are symbols that look like the things that you are used to calling polynomials. They're a constant, quote unquote, plus some element of the underlying set, often the one you're 
used to working with is the real numbers times some symbol called x plus a2 times x squared, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Well, here's the set that I want you to look at. Now I have to define two binary operations on the set, one called addition and one called multiplication. And the point is those operations are exactly as you're used to in the standard situation where the ring R happens to be the real numbers. So we define addition and multiplication on this set as usual for polynomials, polynomials. And folks, I could spend 10 minutes showing you specifically what those things look like, but we'll never need the formal description of what does it mean to say take this and, and multiply it by this or take this and just, you just do it. Let me give you some clues to what the issues are. Presumably you've handed me a symbol like this, and then you'll hand me another symbol that looks like that. Of course, the second symbol that you hand me might not correspond to the same value of n here. Yeah, you might hand me a polynomial of, eventually, of course, we're going to call this the degree, a polynomial of degree 3 and a polynomial of degree 5. So how do you add those together? Well, technically, if I'm going to define the addition, I somehow have to add some terms in to make sure that the two things sort of look the same. In other words, I have to make the degree 3 polynomial sort of expand it out a little bit by adding 0x to the fourth plus 0x to the fifth. Now I have two degree n polynomials for the same n. Now I'm going to teach you how to add them just by adding the coefficients, just as you'd expect. I mean, that's something that you don't even worry about anymore. If I ask you to add 1 plus x squared to x cubed, well, the first one's a degree 2 and the second one's a degree 3. How do you add them? Answer, you just, you sort of in your head are thinking, well, there's a 0x cubed tacked on to the end of the 1 plus x squared. No problem with 0 plus Similarly, for multiplication, well, multiplication could cause a little bit more grief only because here the underlying coefficients, the ring R, might not even be commutative. So that, and we've seen an example of this, if you try to multiply two things like, uh, you know, A plus B or 1 plus X, and not one like, uh, let me not go there. It, it, the, the key is you're, you're going to need to be a little bit careful on the order that you multiply these things in and make sure that you go ahead and keep whatever order you're handed these things in straight. En enough said. I don't want to write out the formal definition. When you see two polynomials and you're asked to add them, you'll be able to do that easily. If you're, see, if you're handed two polynomials and you're asked to multiply them, you just multiply the two expressions together as you would uh, expect. All right, we call this ring notationally this, R bracket X. And we'll do some examples in a minute, but it's important to keep in mind what the role of this symbol X is. And you're used to thinking of X as some sort of indeterminate, as some sort of expression that you're going to somehow plug something into and that the polynomial is viewed as a function that's going to spit out a value. Okay, that's been a good description of polynomials, and that will typically serve as well. But I want you to view the symbols in this set purely as symbols. Whatever this X means, well, all right, it might be the case that we might plug something into it later. But for now, just manipulate it as if you would a polynomial, and don't try to ascribe any sort of meaning to what that is. In particular, there's really nothing special about calling this thing X. We could just as easily call it T. And that's the indeterminate call it Y or something like that. The ring that you'll get, even though the letters look different, of course, will be the same ring. It's polynomials in whatever the, speci the specified variable name is. So we get a ring. And it turns out then R of X. And boy, I'm not going to prove much if any of this is a ring. So here's going to be the question. If I know something about the coefficients that I'm using to build the polynomials, can I then conclude something about this collection as a ring in and of itself? Well, I mean, there's lots of easy observations. Proof omitted. It all works out just fine. 
I mean, everything is straightforward. You know, associativity is dependent on the Well, one thing that we might be interested in doing is checking that, for instance, if the original ring R, if the coefficient ring has unity, that R bracket X also has unity, and that's pretty easy to show. I mean, if, if I hand you the number one, I can view it as an element of R bracket X. You just look at one plus, well, that's it, just one because that's a completely legitimate term. Here's a symbol inside R bracket X. Just let N equal zero and let A sub zero be one. So you have the number one inside the ring, R bracket X. In fact, you have any symbol that lives inside the coefficient ring viewable as an element sitting inside R bracket X. Question? Uh, just any subset you want. And AI, yeah, it come from the set capital R. So, for example, uh, let's look at, uh, how about Z2 in bracket X? Actually, let's look at something a little bit more interesting. How about Z5 bracket X? Boy, I didn't say that. Z2 of X is totally interesting. But Z5X will play up the ideas that I'm trying to get across a little bit more clearly. So here is the ring. The coefficients happen to come from that field. So here's something in there, maybe uh, 2 plus 3x squared plus x to the seventh. So here's an element in z, uh, z5 bracket x. Okay. So I've simply written down expressions where the coefficients in front of each of the x to the power terms comes from z sub 5. Well, just as we're used to, I don't have to put a 1 in. I'm going to interpret a 1 being there. If you need to, of course, you can interpret this as a 0x that you haven't written in, and a 0x cubed that you haven't written in, and a 0x to the fourth that you haven't written in, and, you know, et cetera, 0x to the sixth that you haven't written in. In addition, if you wanted to, you could write it as 0x to the eighth as well. But just um, make sure that you've written it in a form that looks like this because, I mean, technically the way I've written it out, you're supposed to list out things from a constant term and then an x to the first and an x to the second all the way up to some number n. I don't care what that number is. So technically I've got all these terms that I would otherwise write in, but of course that gets pretty cumbersome. I'll just leave those out. Uh, what do you want to call that element? Well, I mean, typically we call polynomials functions. We use the letters F or G or something like that. So maybe this is a good name for this element. Or sometimes we might call it F of X, just to indicate what the underlying variable happens to look like. Uh, here's another one. How about G of X? G of X is uh, 1 plus X plus 2X squared. That's also in Z5X. And let's go ahead and, well, if I add them in Z5X, all right, well, let's see, the, the definition of addition is you just add like terms here. So the constant term turns out to be 3. Let's see, the linear term here is 0 and the linear term here is 1, so I just get X. The quadratic term here is 3 and the quadratic term here is 2, and so when I add those together, I get 5X squared which because the coefficients come from Z5, the interpretation of this is inside that ring. And of course, 5 is the same as 0 inside Z5. So it turns out when you add these two things together, the quadratic terms disappear, plus 0, plus, let's see, the last term that I'm going to get is uh, x to the seventh. So adding them turns out to not be an issue. And you'll notice when you add, some of the terms might disappear. It's OK. If I try to multiply them now, f of x times g of x, all right, well, let's list them next to each other. 2 plus 3x squared plus x to the seventh. I'm going to multiply that times 1 plus x plus 2x squared equals, let's see what we get. Well, folks, we're just foiling these things out, right? So you've got to do this times this. Now, because I'm in a commutative ring, I sort of don't have to worry whether I'm doing that times that or that times that. But that's all right. 2 times 1 is 2. Let's see. Are there any more terms that could contribute to the 
constant term? No, because all these other terms have powers of x on them. So there's the constant term. How about the x term? Well, if I have x times 2, there's the only x term. All the other products are going to give me higher powers. How about an x squared term? Well, here's an x squared term. 2x squared times 2. So I've got 2 times 2, which is 4. I've then got 3 times 1, which is 3. And that'll be the x squared term. So again, I've done 2 times 2x squared, and I've done 3x squared times 1. And I've chosen to write the coefficient just by factoring the x squared term out. So there's the x squared term. How about x cubed terms? Well, let's see, yeah, I have a, an x squared times an x here. So I get 3x cubed. How about an x to the fourth term? Yeah, 3x squared times 2 is 6x squared. I'll put that in parens for now because we'll have to um, trade this in for something that looks like it's an element in the coefficient ring inside Z5. Let's see, any x to the fifth terms? Nope, because the only way I'd get an x to the fifth term is by multiplying one of these by... Let's see, I'd have to multiply this by an x to the fifth, and I don't have one. I'd have to multiply this by an x to the fourth, and I don't have one. I'd have to multiply this by an x cubed, and I don't have one. How about x to the uh, sixth terms? Oh, good, same reason. How about x to the seventh terms? Yeah, I got one of those, so x to the seventh. x to the eighth terms? Yeah, I got one of those. Hmm. And how about x to the ninth terms? Yeah, I got one of those. x to the seventh times 2x squared is... 2x to the ninth. Now let's just do the quick simplification. 4 plus 3 is 7, but inside z5 that's the same as 2. 6, of course, inside z5 is the same as 1. So the product of these two polynomials, you just knock it out. Now that's what you get. Okay, so there's really nothing different here other than you have to keep track of what the underlying coefficients are doing. Specifically, you have to keep track of what the ring r is that's being used as the coefficients and simply do all of the ring operations with that system in mind. All right. Questions, comments? Yeah, question, Tracy. So let's see, so is the question how many elements are in this ring? Yes. The, yeah, so let's write that down. Exactly right. So the proposition is for any ring R, I don't care if R is finite or infinite, R, the ring R bracket X always contains infinitely many elements. Infinitely many elements. And there's lots of ways to prove it. Let me just convince you that inside there, there's always infinitely many different things, regardless of what the underlying ring is. Proof, here's infinitely many things in there. Well, I'm going to assume, OK, with unity. That's fine, but that's sort of a non-assumption. That's what we'll always be starting with. So here is something that's a symbol of the correct form. It's the situation where a sub 0 is 0 and n equals 0. So that's perfectly legit. Here's another one. Technically, I've sort of left the 1 out, but that's all right. It's the situation where a sub 0 is 0, a sub 1 is 1, and n is 1. You stop there. Here's another legit symbol. Another legit symbol. Now maybe, Tracy, it's a little clearer if I point back to this example here. You'll notice, folks, that the coefficients are taken from z sub 5. So if you see a 5, you get to replace it with a 0. If you see a 6, you get to replace it with 1. But that's only happening in the coefficients. It's certainly not happening in the exponents. The fact that this is x to the 7th is x to the 7th. Just because my coefficients are coming from z5, you don't treat this like x squared or anything like that. Okay? So be careful. There's a significant difference between what's going on in the exponents and what's going on in the coefficients. So even though on the surface you look at this and say, oh, there's finitely many things in here, yeah, that's fine, but the powers of x sort of propagate as big as they want. All right. So here is 
I mean, here's the sort of question that we need to address early on, which is, if somebody hands you a ring that you know something about, like maybe somebody hands you a ring that's a field or that is commutative or that doesn't have zero divisors or is an integral domain or is unit, you know, has unity, whatever it is, whatever properties we can talk about a ring are, we can then ask the question, does that same property carry over to the polynomial ring R bracket X? Well, one thing we've already noted, let's say uh, properties of R do properties of R carry over to properties of R bracket X? And the answer in general is definitely no. But this is sort of two questions in one. One is, if I hand you a property, does that same property hold in R bracket X? And question two is, if I hand you a property for R, is there some property that holds in R bracket X based on the property of the appropriate coefficients? Let me give you a good example. Example, uh, if R has unity, I hate that notation, I've mentioned that a few times, then R bracket X has unity. Yeah, we already talked about it tonight. You know, if you start with something that behaves like the number one inside R, then you can view that thing as, in effect, a constant polynomial, and it will behave exactly the way it's supposed to. So here's one very minimalist remark, but it has the right flavor. If you can tell me something about R, then in fact you can tell me that that same thing happens in R bracket X. Here's another example. Example, if R is commutative. then so is R bracket X is also commutative. Why? Because when you're doing the multiplication of two polynomials, if in each of the situations that you're multiplying the corresponding coefficients together, you can switch the order, then basically you just take whatever the product is switch all of the individual pieces in each of the coefficients and you'll realize that's the same as the product of the two things having been taken as polynomials in R bracket X. You know, I'm not going to write the technical proofs of these things because they're, I mean, they're, they're somewhat tedious and distasteful. I'm just trying to give you a, a feel as to the sorts of questions that we can ask here. Similarly, if R is not commutative, then R bracket X is not commutative. If there's two things inside R that you can't change the order on, then you can sort of build things inside R bracket X that you can't change the order of multiplication on. Here is a much bigger example. Example, if, and I'm going to list it as a proposition. So example three will be phrased as a proposition. Example three, uh, if R, I'll phrase it as an integral domain, is an integral domain, integral domain, then so is R bracket X. I hesitated just for a minute there. I could have phrased this, if R has zero divisors, then R bracket X has zero divisors. And I could phrase this as, if R doesn't have zero divisors, then R bracket X doesn't have zero divisors. Got to be careful there. Yeah, it doesn't have zero divisors. So the point is this. If you give me coefficients, and you can't multiply two non-zero things to get zero in the coefficients, then it's the case that you can't multiply two non-zero polynomials and get zero. And the reason is, uh, reason, all right, well, let's see. I'm going to avoid defining as many terms as I can tonight, but eventually I'll have to get to this description. I'm going to tell you in the ring of coefficients, in the collection of things that you're multiplying together as the coefficients, I'm going to tell you that it's impossible to find two non-zero things 
so that when you multiply them together, you get zero. Okay, that's the given information. That's what it means to say R is an integral domain. Technically, it means a little bit more. It means R is commutative and has unity. Okay, that's fine. But we've just noted that if R has unity, then R bracket X does. And we've noted that if R is commutative, then R bracket X is. So, okay, so those two pieces of being an integral domain are already satisfied in R bracket X. Now we just have to show that R bracket X has no zero divisors. So I have to convince you that if I take two non-zero polynomials and I multiply them together, that I get something not zero. You've got your hand thinking, I don't know how to multiply two non-zero polynomials together ever and get something zero, so why is this an issue? I'll show you an example of that in a minute, but here's the point. If I multiply two polynomials together, notice what happens in these highest terms. If I'm multiplying stuff corresponding to lower powers and then Combining, it's possible that I might have two similar power terms that add together to somehow contribute to the coefficient on one of these. But the only way that you can get something contributing to the coefficient on the highest power term, and what is the highest power term? It's going to be x to whatever the highest power term is here, plus whatever that number is here, just like you're used to. So the degree of the product is going to be 9. The point is that the coefficient in front of the highest power term in the product, the coefficient here, is simply the product of the highest power coefficient here and the highest power coefficient here. That's what appears here. And the point is, to even talk about the highest power coefficient means that the coefficient that you've got sitting in front of here is not zero. Because if this was zero, then it wouldn't be degree seven, it'd be degree two. Similarly, the highest power term in the other polynomial has a coefficient in front of it that's not zero. And the point is, if the underlying ring is assumed to be an integral domain, it means if you take two non-zero elements and you multiply them together, you get something not zero. So the coefficient in front of the highest power term here is going to be not zero because of the hypothesis in R. And if this thing is not zero, then the polynomial is not the zero polynomial, and that's all we need to show. Okay. So the reason here is this. Let, mm, let f of x have degree, oh, let's call it n1, where degree means what? It means tell me the highest power of x that appears, and let g of x have degree n sub 2. And I'm going to assume that I'm going to start with two non-zero polynomials. Now, technically, folks, it's possible for a polynomial to have degree 0. That just means it's a constant term. So degree 0 is fine. Degree 0 is fine. But the point is the product f of x times g of x has as the coefficient, coefficient on the x to the n1 plus n2 term, the product of the leading coefficients of each of the individual polynomials. Of the leading coefficients from the two original ones. From f of x and g of x. And the point is, these leading coefficients are assumed to be non-zero. That's what allows me to write down the statement that the first one has degree n1 and the second one has degree n2. In particular, so since r is an integral domain, an integral domain, uh, we get that this coefficient is not zero. is non-zero, and that's all we need, so the product is non-zero. So f of x times g of x is non-zero. And that's all we need to do. To show something is an integral domain, specifically here to show r bracket x is an integral domain, all we have to do is show that if we take two non-zero elements in there and multiply them together, that we get something non-zero, and that's exactly what we've done here. In fact, we get a non-zero expression, and I can actually identify at least one term that turns out to be non-zero 
x to the n1 plus n2 term, where you simply add the two degrees of the polynomials that you're multiplying together. All right. All right. Now, if you're going to say, well, an integral domain really is a commutative ring with unity, that blah, 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 you're right. But remember, these first two examples say, as long as you start with a ring with unity that is commutative, and that's part of the definition of R being an integral domain, then in fact, R bracket X has both those properties as well. So it's sort of interesting. It says, as long as you start with a commutative ring with unity that has no zero divisors, then you don't impose any new zero divisors inside the collection of polynomials. Now I'm going to offer just four contrasts, but we're not going to look at, we won't look at any of these examples with much interest, if at all, for the remainder of the semester. Contrast that with, if I start with something that's not an integral domain, like Z6, and I look at polynomials over what might happen? Well, here's a polynomial, f of x equals 2x to the seventh, and here's another one, g of x equals 3x to the ninth. What happens if I multiply f of x times g of x? What do I get? I get 6 times x to the sixteenth. But 6 inside z6 is 0. So you see, it's possible to get what seem to be honest to goodness polynomials, multiply them together to give zero if somehow the underlying system has zero divisors to begin with. Okay? And so we're going to be interested in avoiding this sort of situation. The reason this could wind up being zero is, look, I took the two highest power terms. Of course, the highest power terms are the entire polynomial. I haven't added anything down here, but that's fine. This is a polynomial of degree seven. This is a polynomial of degree nine. And I multiplied them together, and I got a polynomial of degree, well, I got zero. To say. All right. Questions? All right. What we're about to do is look more formally at the notion of the degree of two polynomials, and then we'll write down a result that's true for integral domains. And that's this. So more formally, formally, we need to define what the degree of a polynomial is. Uh, the degree of an element of R bracket X is one of two things. Is either, well, there's two possibilities. It's either the exponent or the maximum exponent appearing in the polynomial. in the polynomial. You might say that that's what it is, right? Polynomial. That only happens in case the polynomial that you've handed me is not the zero polynomial. The polynomial that you start with is not the zero polynomial. So if somebody hands you a polynomial and asks you what's the degree of that polynomial, just look at the thing, pick out the highest power of x that appears, and say the polynomial has degree blah. But now the question is, all right, if somebody hands you the polynomial that is 0, not degree 0, but 0, question what number do we assign to the degree of that polynomial? And the answer is we don't assign it any number. Or undefined. if the polynomial is 0. I've written it out in words because this seems to cause a little bit of grief for students. Let me write it out now more formally. In other words, i.e., the degree of a polynomial f of x, and here's the notation for degree, is either the highest or maximum maximum exponent if the polynomial is not zero and is undefined if f of x is the zero polynomial. 
And if you think, well, why make such a big deal about the degree of the zero polynomial? The answer is we're going to write down some results that just aren't true if you assign the zero polynomial degree zero. In fact, as we look at the results that we'll prove about the degree of various polynomials, it turns out what some authors wind up doing is very naturally assigning the value negative infinity to the degree of the zero polynomial, which seems totally strange. Other authors, for perfectly good reasons, assign the zero polynomial degree negative one. But whatever you do, don't assign it the value zero, because then none of our formulas are going to work out. Proposition. Proposition. Uh, if R is an integral domain, then, oh, <laughs> yep, and f of x, g of x are non-zero, not degree non-zero, are non-zero polynomials. In other words, I haven't just given you the big goose egg here. Take a polynomial. I don't care if it's a constant polynomial, the constant polynomial of two, that's perfectly legit. Just don't take zero for either of these. Then the punchline is, then the degree of the product is exactly what you'd expect it to be. Look, if you multiply two polynomials together, What's the degree? You tell me what the highest power of x is here. You tell me what the highest power of x is here. You multiply those terms together. That gives you the highest power of x over here. And when you multiply the highest powers together, you're adding the exponents. Is the degree of f of x plus the degree of g of x. Plus here. Yeah, that makes sense. If you hand me a polynomial of degree uh, 3 and a polynomial, uh, polynomial of degree 2 and a polynomial of degree 7 and you multiply them together, then you get a degree 9 polynomial. You get next to the ninth term. Okay, two quick comments. The first comment is we need this sort of hypothesis because if you start with a system that's not an integral domain, heck, it's possible to have polynomials that when you multiply them together don't give you a polynomial of degree 16 here. Heck, in fact, the thing can totally crap out and give you zero. Or as another example, if I would have just added something onto here, if I would have written something like 1 plus 2x to the seventh and multiplied it times this, all right, then the product wouldn't have been zero, but it certainly wouldn't have been a degree 16 polynomial because that degree 16 term is still going to wipe out. All right, you get a degree 7, you get something less than it. But as long as the underlying system is an integral domain, technically all you need is dot zero divisors. You don't need to worry about commutativity or existence of unity or something like that. But those are always going to be true in the systems that we're going to look at. Then it turns out there's a formula for degree. Now notice, folks, if I would have allowed one or the other or both of these to be the zero polynomial, then this formula would not have been true. Because, hey, if one of these is zero, then the result is zero. And so, you know, if you start with a degree 6 polynomial and you multiply it by 0, you're not going to get a polynomial of degree, you know, 6 plus anything. So, for what it's worth, here's a at least somewhat reasonable uh, or somewhat logical reason why it might not be unreasonable to define the degree of the 0 polynomial to be negative infinity. If you define it to be negative infinity, at least this formula holds true. Because then, if you take something like a degree 6 times the 0 polynomial, then this is the 0 polynomial, so its degree is negative infinity. Over here, you get 6 plus negative infinity, which is negative infinity, and your formula works out. But that, to me, seems a little bit artificial. So for us, just don't worry about the 0 polynomial. It's just it's not a good thing. All right. I won't prove it. I just proved it for you in words. This is a um, property of polynomials that we're going to use. So what we focused on for the last 15 minutes is this. In the very nice situation where you happen to start with an integral domain for the coefficients, we've shown that the resulting polynomial ring is also an integral domain. But now here's where things get a little bit different. So now what you might be expecting is, look, we showed that if R is, has unity, then so does R bracket X. We've shown that if 
R is commutative, then so is R bracket X. We've shown that if R is an integral domain, then so is R bracket X. Well, the sort of next candidate in line is what if R happens to be a field? And you may be expecting, well, then R bracket X is a field, and that is never true. So the punchline turns out to be, I don't care what system you start with for the coefficients, when you form the polynomial rings, you never get a field, not just sometimes. So the next thing that you might be expecting in line, the sort of next natural statement, what can you say about R bracket X based on what you know about R, fails miserably if you try starting with R equals a field. So note the situation of most interest, of most interest, interest will be when R, the ring of coefficients, is a field. All right, well, of course, we proved that every field is an integral domain. So in particular, in particular, this last example, R is an integral domain. When R is a field, that's nice. So we just prove, so in this case, this case, at least the polynomial ring is an integral domain. So we just proved. So that's reassuring. If I start with elements coming from a field, at least I know that the polynomials don't contain any zero divisors. The question in though is, though, is it the case that Every polynomial, every non-zero polynomial has a multiplicative inverse, and the answer is absolutely not. But, and this is something we've actually stated already twice, proposition, I don't care what R is, R bracket X is never a field. A field. I don't care what R is. Make R good, make R bad, make R anything, you never get a field. And the proof of this is, I can write down a non-zero element, let's call it this. I mean, I can write down a lot of examples. I can write down x to the fourth if you want. Here is a non-zero element of R bracket x. Does it have a multiplicative inverse? Can you find something in R bracket x? Can you find a polynomial so that when you multiply that polynomial times x that you get the multiplicative identity? And of course, the answer is no. Has no multiplicative inverse. Why? Because the unity of R bracket X is 1. You might say, well, I thought that was the unity of R. Yeah, but it's also the unity of R bracket X viewed as a polynomial of degree 0. And so the point is you can't solve, i.e., X times G of X is never equal to 1 for every g of x in R bracket x. Now, just to avoid the silly situations, but it turns out the silly situations can't come up anyway. It's just I'm not worried about focusing on those. Even if you start with R as a field, all right, what are you trying to do? You're trying to cook up a polynomial so that when you multiply it times x, you get 1. And folks, that can't happen. Look, because if I take x, if you're working over a field, an integral domain, there's no zero divisors. The degree of a product is always the sum of the two degrees. So as long as you've got something of degree bigger than zero, I just happen to have chosen x, I could have chosen a whole lot of other things, it's impossible to multiply it and get a result that has lower degree than the thing you started with. This has degree one, this has degree zero. And there's x to the zero in it. That is when it's impossible to cook up a polynomial for which that happens because there are no polynomials of negative degree. Huh. Now, if you're asking, well, why don't you just invent some polynomials of negative degree? You can. That's a completely different beast, though. For us, polynomial means constant plus something times x plus something times x squared plus et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So here's the punchline. These things, R bracket X, that we're going to focus on for the remainder of the semester are typically pretty nice 
because if you start with the coefficients being from an integral domain, at least r bracket x is an integral domain. In particular, the case that will be of most interest to us, if you start with a field for the coefficients, at least r bracket x is an integral domain. But it's never a field. There's always things in there that don't have multiplicative inverse. Now we've been looking at, for the last three weeks, an important example of a commutative ring with unity that is an integral domain that isn't a field. That's the ring of integers. The integers in an integral domain, if you multiply two non-zero integers together, you certainly get not zero. But it's certainly not a field because, in fact, most elements in the integers don't have multiplicative inverses. The only two that do are, zero, are one and minus one. The intuition that I'm going to have you start developing is that these things, r bracket x, at least when you start with r being a field, are integral domains that aren't fields. And it'll turn out that a lot of the things that you know about properties of the integers are also going to be true about properties of polynomials. Okay? So that's the, the sort of analogy that I want to start playing up in here. Properties of the integers and properties of the ring of polynomials with coefficients taken from a field turn out to be extremely similar in many situations. Not identical. I mean, we can't say everything that's true in Z is also true in R bracket X, but many things are, and we will get to those. Yeah, actually, we'll get to a couple of examples tonight. Okay. Questions? Comments? All right. Let's see. Yeah, I think we'll do this now. So, yeah, because that, that'll be a good lead into the following comment. So the intuition, intuition is this, that uh, if R is a field, is a field, then the ring R bracket X behaves uh, a lot like Z. And at least at this stage, what we can say is, for example, both are integral domains. Integral domains. And uh, both are not fields. Okay, so there's two things that these particular rings have in common. I'm going to give you a third one. Uh, for those of you that saw the number theory course, this will be familiar. For those of you that maybe haven't, the idea is completely familiar. It's just third grade arithmetic. If I hand you a couple of whole numbers, integers, it makes sense to divide one into the other. It makes sense to divide 7 into 23 or something like that. Your intuition is when you divide 7 into 23, what that's supposed to mean is that you sort of take as many 7s out of 23 as you can and then tell me what the remainder is. And the remainder is understood to be something that, well, is bigger than or equal to 0 and somehow less than the thing that you're dividing by. I mean, I can divide 7 into 23 and get 1 with a remainder of 16. I mean, 7 goes into 23 one time with 16 left over. That's a technically correct statement, but what you're thinking, well, that's not really what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to do is sort of, you know, take more out until I can't take a full one out again. Right? That process, for those of you that saw the number theory course, is called the division algorithm. So the division algorithm, algorithm in the integers, this is third grade long division. Where do you do that? Fourth grade, maybe? I don't know. It's the moral equivalent of third grade long division. You know, give me any, ooh, you've got to be a little bit careful. You can't ask me to divide zero into something because division by zero is meaningless. But give me something that's not zero. Then I can ask you to write it in a certain way. And the way that plays out, folks, is as follows. For any. Yeah, for any 
for any two integers a and b in the integers, but don't pick the thing that you're going to divide by to be zero. There is uh, a unique way way to write uh, a is q times b plus a remainder where the thing that you've left over in absolute value is bigger than or equal to zero and I'm sorry is uh, r is less than the absolute value of the thing that you're dividing by. You can always take a non-zero integer and divide it into any other integer and what we ask that to mean is you can write the second integer some multiple of the first one and the thing that you've left over, this remainder, has the property that uh, its value is always less than the absolute value of the thing that you're dividing by. And now if you haven't seen the division algorithm in this form, I mean, just think about it for a minute. The interesting case, of course, is when you're dividing by something bigger than zero, that's typical. And all this says is, is, hey, you just keep taking as many B's out of A as you can. How many? You take that many out until the thing that you've left over, well, you can certainly allow a zero remainder. That's perfectly legit. But at least the thing that you've left over is less than the thing that you've been dividing by. That's the division algorithm in Z. What we're about to write down is its corresponding statement in R bracket X. There is a division algorithm for R bracket X. It says if you hand me two polynomials, but make sure the second one isn't just the zero polynomial, that it makes sense to divide this polynomial into the other one. So what we're doing is long division of polynomials. And it turns out that a result quite similar to this one holds there. That there's only one way to do it if you specify that the thing that you want me to leave out here, the thing that you want to act as the remainder is intuitively smaller than the thing that you've divided by. The difference is going to be the measure for how big the original divisor was and the corresponding remainder was simply its size. The quantity that plays the corresponding role when we're dividing polynomials is the degree of the polynomial. If I hand you two polynomials and ask which is bigger, that question doesn't make any sense. I can ask which is the bigger degree polynomial. That makes sense. And so what we use for some sort of standard or basis for comparison of polynomials isn't the polynomial itself, but the degree of the polynomial. So here it is. This is the corresponding division algorithm in R bracket X. And this is theorem, what number? Theorem 23.1. Theorem 23.1. The text says this let R be a field. And that's key here, folks. You can't get away with this division algorithm in R bracket X unless you're starting with coefficients from a field. And then the punchline is let uh, f of X and g of X be elements of R bracket X where the degree of g of X, I think we can get away with at least zero but let g of x be a polynomial that actually has some guts to it. I mean, let, that, that's got some x's in it. Don't just tell me to divide by 2. Tell me to divide by x squared plus 3 or something like this. Then here's the punchline. Then there exist unique polynomials. I'm going to call one of them Q of X, that's suspicious, and the other one R of X, that's suspicious, okay. with the property that two things are true. First, that you can write the original polynomial F of X as Q of X times G of X plus R of X. 
In other words, you divide f into g, you get something that we call q of x, q for quotient, and you get some remainder. And secondly, where the degree of r bracket x, I'm sorry, of r of x, is less than the degree of g of x. or r of x is 0. Okay, remember, we've got to sort of tease out as a special case the situation where this remainder is 0, which certainly can happen. If you divide one polynomial into another, it might go in, I don't like to use the word evenly, but there might not be a remainder. In other words, the remainder is technically 0. I might say, well, then isn't the degree of the remainder less than the degree of the thing you started with? Well, no, if this thing is 0, then remember, we haven't defined this expression. The degree of r of x makes no sense. So I have to separate out the remainder being 0 as simply a separate case. Here's the division algorithm in r bracket x. So um, quiz 4 happens on Monday. And quiz 4 is this. Just tell me this. I'm going to ask you to come in Monday right at the beginning of class, and I'll hand you a sheet of paper that says state theorem 23.1, state the division algorithm for r bracket x, where r is a field, and you can just either spit out what I've just written on the board if you want, or if you'd like to memorize the book's version verbatim, they might state things minimally differently, but it's exactly the same idea. Things that you need to be careful of are, first of all, the division algorithm for r bracket x requires that the underlying coefficients come from a field. All right, so that's here. Uh, let me point out another couple of things that students often forget. Secondly, the division algorithm only holds when you're dividing by polynomials with some guts, when you're dividing by something that looks like you know, g of x equals x squared or something like that. Uh, the division algorithm isn't true if you start with something from the original field, in other words, a, a degree zero polynomial. Okay. Uh, let's see, most students do fine here. Um, make sure you put this word in. There exists unique polynomials. In other words, if you found two polynomials, q of x and r of x, that make both of these conditions true, then there's only one way to do that. You and your friend will have come up with the same answer. Okay. And finally, most people write down this piece, but you have to remember to include the possibility that the remainder polynomial might be the zero polynomial. Not a degree zero, but the zero polynomial. Let's do an example. Example, this will just be a refresher on long division of polynomials, which some of you haven't done for a while. It's all right. Um, all right, this one might be slightly interesting because remember the... Well, at least the statement, I'm not going to prove this for you. It's essentially that long division of polynomials works. But uh, the statement is, this holds regardless of what field you start with. You're used to doing it in R bracket X, where R is the reals, or maybe complexes. But you know, we're a little more sophisticated than that now. So uh, I'll let f of x be x to the fifth plus 1, and g of x be x squared plus 1 in this polynomial ring, z2x. Now, here's the phrase, divide uh, g into f as in the division algorithm. Divide g into f of x. So that request means complete the division algorithm by writing f of x is something times g of x plus the remainder. Well, I mean, you just you do the long division as you're used to. It's just you have to keep in mind where the appropriate coefficients are coming from. So what do you do? You write x squared plus 1, and then you're going to divide it into, well, x to the fifth plus 1. So you typically put some, what, placeholders here, plus 0, plus 0, x plus 1. Okay. This is standard when you're doing long division of polynomials. You divide highest coefficient into highest coefficient, x squared into x to the fifth goes x cubed times. And now you do the multiplication. x cubed times x squared is x to the fifth. x cubed times 1 is 
x cubed, and then what do you do? You subtract, right? So all this is golden so far. So the x of the fifth minus x of the fifth cancels out, and I mean, you're all nodding your heads, that's good. Here's where things get a little bit different. x cubed, no, I'm sorry, that's zero x cubed minus x cubed, so you'd want to write down that, right? But remember where the coefficients are coming from. And so the coefficient here is minus 1. But inside the ring Z2, minus 1 is 1. So that's the same as that. Remember, minus 1 equals 1 in Z2. So we make some sort of uh, simplification based on the coefficients that we're working with. All right, that's fine. So now I have an x cubed here. So what's the next step? Divide x squared into x cubed. And what are we going to get? An x term, right? Because x squared into x cubed gives x. So now I have x times x squared gives x cubed. And then I have x times 1 gives x. And subtract again. I get x cubed minus x cubed is 0. I get x minus x gives, well, minus x, which is the same as plus x, because minus 1 is plus 1. All right, now what? Let's see. Oh, now I bring down the, hmm? And now I'm done. Why? Because the degree of the thing that I'm dividing by is less than the degree of the thing that I'm trying to divide into. So here's the punchline. So the original polynomial, which was x to the fifth plus 1, is q of x, that's what appears on the top, x cubed plus x, times the thing that we're dividing by, g of x, x squared plus 1, plus the remainder, and the remainder here is x plus 1. The key being that the remainder, the degree of r of x, is 1. And that's less than the degree of g of x, which in this case happens to be 2. Uh, a quick suggestion, especially when you're working over z2x, just multiply these things out and make sure you get back to your original one. And on the surface, that looks a little bit weird. I mean, it looks like you're adding everything. And somehow, all you're going to be left with is x to the fifth plus 1. So it's a little bit counterintuitive, but, but yeah, you are. Let's see if we multiply this out. We get x to the fifth plus x cubed plus x cubed plus x plus, so when I multiply that out, I get this, plus x plus 1. And what's the beauty of working in z2x? Look, if I have x cubed plus x cubed, 0, because if you want to think of it as 2x cubed, that's fine. Or, because we proved last time that if we have the coefficient ring being characteristic d. Then the polynomials also have characteristic d. Here I start with a coefficient ring of characteristic 2. If I add two things together, then I get 0. Here I've added the same thing together. I get 0. So this is just x to the fifth plus 1, and it checks. Check. All right. Not bad. Not bad. Questions there? Comments? Let me make a quick observation. Uh, example, if you're working in something a little bit more complicated than Z2, but still a field, let's look at a couple of polynomials maybe in uh, uh, Z7. If I hand you something like 3x squared plus 1, that's a g of x, and I hand you uh, 5x cubed plus uh, 2x squared plus 4, that's f of x. And I want this to happen, divide uh, g of x into f of x. But I want all these being viewed inside z7x. In other words, I want you to interpret the coefficients as living inside z7. Then we set things up exactly the same way. You're still going to do a long division. So you'll be dividing 3x squared plus 1 into 5x cubed plus 2x squared. And I'll write it out as 0x plus 4. But now the game gets a little bit 
more interesting. I mean, if you're going to do this into this in general, what you're figuring to put here is what? 5 thirds x, right? But I don't know what 5 thirds means. So here's what you have to do. You're interested in somehow putting a term here so that when you multiply this times this that you get 5x cubed. Well, I know what power of x to use because it's going to be x times x squared to give me an x cubed term. What I need to figure out, though, is what the coefficient is. So I need to figure out some way of writing down a coefficient here so that when I multiply it by 3, I get 5, and I'm working in the system z sub 7. There's a couple of ways of doing that. One is just list everything out and just try all possibilities. 3 times 1 is 3. No good. 3 times 2 is 6. No good. 3 times 3 is 9, which is 2. No good. 3 times 4 is 12 which is 5, so the idea would be put a 4 there. Because 3 times 4, okay. That's maybe not as systematic as you would hope. Here's a better way to go about doing it. I mean, think about what this means, folks, 5 thirds. It's 5 times 3 inverse. And at least in this notation, this looks like the notation that we use in rings as long as this thing happens to be a unit. So what you really want to do is take the thing that you're dividing by, find its inverse inside the given ring. I say, well, how the heck do I know this thing has an inverse? Answer, because the thing that we're starting with is a field. Find what its inverse is, then simply multiply it by whatever this coefficient is. So, for example, another way to do it is, what is 3 inverse in Z7? Well, that we, well, there's, it turns out there's some algorithmic ways to do it, but for us, all we're interested in doing is finding it. We know it exists because 7 is prime, and we've proved that Z sub P is a field whenever P is prime. So we know that we've got to be able to find it. 3 times 1 is 3, 3 times 2 is 6, not 1, 3 times 3 is 9, not 1, 3 times 4 is not 1, 3 times 5 is 15, which is 1. So 3 inverse is 5. So just by sheer coincidence, 3 inverse happens to be 5. So this is 25. And 25 in Z7 is 4. So here's another way of viewing how I got the 4 there. I like playing up this example because it shows that if you're going to hope to have a chance of doing the division algorithm, the things that you've got here and here have to come from a field. The reason being the coefficient that you're going to put on the highest power of x in this thing that gets kicked out as the quotient as q has to have the property that this times this is that. And the only systems you're guaranteed for that to happen in are underlying systems for fields. Okay. Question? John? Yeah, the first time I got 4, I just went through the list. I need something so that when I multiply 4 times 3, I get 5. 4 times 1, no, I'm sorry, 3 times 1 is 3. 3 times 2 is 6, not 5. 3 times 3 is 9, which in Z7 is 2, but it's not 5. 3 times 4 is 12, which in Z7 happens to be 5, and that's how we get the answer. All right, so I'll let you sort of finish this up, et cetera. Etc. You'd multiply this out, you get what 5x cubed because we've rigged it that way, and then you get 4x times 3 is plus 4x, and then you, oh, I'm sorry, 4x, yeah, plus 4x. Sorry, I'm gonna put it in the right column here, plus 4x, and then you go ahead and etc. Okay. All right. Questions, comments. Let's see if I need to. Give me any more info about this? Uh, nope, that's a good place to quit. Oh, yeah. Let me give you one last remark because this will help you on one of the homework problems that you were given. Folks, if I hand you one of these, I'm going to call it F bracket X, where capital F stands for a field now. So these rings are always infinite. There's always infinitely many different polynomials, regardless of how big the coefficients are. Even if the coefficients only have two elements, 0 and 1, you can still produce infinitely many polynomials. Here's a question that you can ask. Tell me all of the polynomials of degree 3. 
Well, if I hand you the field as the real numbers and you ask to list out all the polynomials having degree 3, you know, forget it. You have no chance. x cubed, 2x cubed, 3x cubed, 4x cubed, 5x cubed, and I haven't even gotten to, you know, x cubed plus x squared stuff. So the question, find all of the, or how many are there, blah, 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 in general is not a legit question. But if you're working in a system like Z2x, it makes perfect sense to ask the question, tell me all the polynomials of degree 3. Well, yeah, here are some of them. All polynomials or elements of this ring of given degree makes sense if f is finite. So for example, all polynomials in Z2x of degree 3, well, here's one. Here's another one. No, here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. You know, et cetera. You, at least in this case, because the coefficients are finite, you have a chance of being able to list out all polynomials of a given degree. And that's what you'll be asked to do in one of the homework problems that I handed you on Monday. So if you're going to look at these over the weekend, then that's a good place to look for information about. But don't, you know, don't go overboard here. The question, list out all of, or tell me how many there are polynomials of a given degree is only a reasonable question if the um, coefficient field happens to be fine. All right, sorry to have run over a little bit. So. Um, if you've got the homework due tonight, I'll let you leave it on the table here. I will have that graded by Monday. Uh, let's see, I'm in tomorrow from 11.30 till noon if you want to come by. And if I don't see before then, have a good weekend and I'll see you on Monday. Lindsay, question. Did you just review like, if you have a negative, like, say you're in Z7 and negative 4 in Z7? Oh, if you have negative 4 in Z7, sure, negative 4, just, you know, add 7 to it, it's positive 3. Yeah? Or if you have negative 2, it's the same as positive 5, you're just, you're working inside.